Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, from wherever in the world that you may be joining us today. My name is Leila Radus. I'm the YMH coordinator and would like to officially open the 12th session of the Distinguished Lecture in Emerging and Systematic Risks, monthly lecture series co-organized by YMH and CFolio. Without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Zare. Professor Afshin Rezai Zare received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Tehran, Iran, and pursued his research at Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of Toronto, Ontario, Canada, as a visiting scientist from 2005 to 2007 and a postdoctoral fellow from 2007 to 2009. He joined Power and Renewable Energy Systems Group at the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at York University in 2017 as an associate professor. Prior to joining York University, he was with Hydro One Network Incorporation, Toronto, Ontario, Canada from 2010 to 2017 working in the departments of special studies, transmission system planning, and transmission reliability and performance analytics. His broad scope of work at Hydro One included various types of power system studies, root cause failure analysis, project planning and budget distribution, risk evaluation, asset management, reliability, and load generation interruption analytics. Professor Zari's contributions in the modeling and analysis Analysis of geomagnetic disturbance and transformers have resulted in several research achievements and development of novel computer tools for the analysis of GMT impacts on power grid. He is also a main contributor to the first in service power system, real time GMT simulator in the world, which is currently the reference of the operator's action at Ontario Grid Control Center. For the GMT real time simulator, he received Hydro One. President Award Innovation. Professor Zare is a registered professional engineer in the province of Ontario, Canada, a senior member of IEE, an associate editor of IEE Transactions on Power Delivery, and the chair of IEE Task Force on Power Equipment Vulnerability to GIC. Dr. Zare, thank you very much for moderating today's session. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Datus. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Afshin Rezai. Thanks a lot for the, the introduction uh, here uh, and today uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Reginald Lee or a speaker today as another lecture and presentation in our distinguished lecture series in emerging and systematic risk uh, with the title or approach to space situational awareness, image analysis and compression. Uh, professor Reginald Lee uh, is a professor of space engineering at the Department of Earth and Space Science and Engineering, Lawson School of Engineering at York University. Professor Reginald Lee has led numerous projects in the area of satellite technologies, including design of microsensors, actuators, microspectrometer development, solar panel technology demonstration, and attitude control design for nanosatellites. Her research focuses on the application of microsystems technologies in satellite design in close partnership with a number of industry and government research partners, including DRDC, Honeywell, Magellan, and MSCI. Uh, Professor Lee, very welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. We have about 35 to 40 minutes for the presentation, followed by about 15 minutes Q&A session. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the very kind introduction. My name is Regina Lee, has been introduced, and it's truly an honor to be here today. Um, I've probably met some of you wearing a very different hat as an administrator in the past, but by far, talking about my research is my favorite thing, and I'm just hoping that I wouldn't go on for too long. Um, since I wasn't sure exactly who would be coming today, I tried to keep it at a very, very high level with a few very pretty images, as, as I would like to think. Um, at the same time, I'm only given half an hour to talk about my 20 years of research career. 
So I'll try to keep it to just only last two, three years, but I do have lots of extra backup slides, as you can see in the bottom left corner. And I would be happy to talk to you about that maybe at a later date or send me an email, get in touch with me. I'm just starting to get a little bit more passionate about my research after coming back from sabbatical. So I'd like to take this as an opportunity to meet each of you and talk about opportunities to work together in other areas. So again, my name is Regina. I actually am old enough to remember Jay's winning the World Series while I was still in undergrad. So I've been around for a while, but I started my career in the industry. I was building not just the satellites, but for a couple of years, I even worked on medical devices. The reason I say that is because there's a lot of things that happen very, very slowly in space. So I started my career at York in 2007, and I proposed to build very small satellites. And for all these years, I've been building things for small satellites, not just the satellites themselves. I purposely didn't put in any satellites, but I worked on three different missions. Um, uh, they're all CubeSat missions, but also payloads for anything that flies, anything from UAVs to kites, aircrafts to balloons. And today I just wanna talk about what we've flown on the balloon. And if I can do one thing today, and, and I, again, many of you probably are not too familiar with the space research. And I heard that Afshin already talked about when things go wrong in space. So he already stole my thunder, it sounds like. But um, I just want to send a message that space is becoming a fourth domain, just like the land, the sky, as in, as in Air Force or, or land. Space is becoming a fourth domain where we do our business every day. When things go wrong in space, it impacts everything we do on Earth. And I'd like to share that passion about why we need to think about sustainability in space going forward. Because things do go wrong. As I said, I actually already talked about it, but that's more on the, the natural side. And things go wrong because of what we have done in space in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And that's one message I'd like to send and just highlight a little bit about what I do about it, what I would like to see as a way forward in building more sustainable, more protected, more reliable, more safe space where we can do business. So quick quiz. I'm a professor, so I can't, afford, I, I can't avoid it. And I realize that it's a seminar for me, so it's not like I can ask questions, somebody's going to answer me back. But... These are the questions that I usually ask when I go into elementary school classrooms or I go to the science center very often. And these are the questions I ask young students and they usually answer the first satellite, second satellite, but not the third one. Surprisingly, first was the Soviet Union and I think everyone knows about it. Second was the Explorer from the US. Third was the Canadian satellite called Alouette. And I'm not sure why we are not so proud of it, but today I'm not really talking about the fact that we are the third country to launch satellite. It's the fact that it happened in 1957. So it's a very recent history if we think about it. And it took years to build a satellite back then. So Canada, we, we used to build only one or two every few years. Um, and that was all state owned and governments and government agencies were the only ones who could afford to build the satellites and operate them. Once we built them, they, we operated for 10, 20 years, but things have changed since then. Today, there are over 8,000 active satellites and it doesn't sound like a lot, but those are 8,000 active ones and they're all in mostly in low earth orbit and geosynchronous orbit. Um, any one of them can be deactivated at any point for various reasons like solar storms or anything else, but it doesn't come back. Once it's deactivated, it still stays on. Not only that they stay on and become debris as in defunct satellites, they fall apart just like cars or cell phones. They're all electronics and components that man have built so they, the chips will fall off, uh, the, the solar panels will crack up. Not only that they fall apart and become small parts, we purposely destroy them in some cases with no plan of bringing them back. In the last few years, we've been talking about pollution in the ocean a lot with the microplastics, debris from the oceans, big liners, whatnot. It's actually getting worse in space too. If we think about it, there are over 100 million objects in a very tiny scale that's still in orbit. It doesn't sound like a lot if you think about it, 10 samuels 
is a size of a satellite. I actually have a mock-up somewhere in my office. It's the size of a Chinese takeout box. It doesn't sound like a lot, but even a millimeter size object hitting a spacecraft can bring down an entire spacecraft within a fraction of a second. Now, if you think about it, um, we now have hundreds of millions of these satellites, and yet there are 8,000 spacecraft that we rely on every day. One of the, again, common questions that I ask young kids is, how do we use satellites? Well, the most common one is to play games, the internet, cell phones, GPS, navigation, weather prediction, um, remote sensing. Any one of these satellites who may fail from these debris can bring down that entire ecosystem and we won't be able to function and maintain our lifestyle as we know today. So it is a really scary thought. Now, a few years ago, one of my students and I thought that we could predict the or project the growth of number of launches or number of operating satellites in future. And that was back around 2017. We just gave up because by just simply looking at the trend, this is one diagram somebody put forward about the rockets and satellite launches. It doesn't follow any mathematical model that we could use. It's just increasing at a rate that we've never seen before. I'm sure we've seen a similar pattern when it comes to microfabrication uh, chips and, and devices at that scale, but no one expected this in the space industry. Let's face it, space is one of the most backward, old fashioned, close minded group of people who still prefer to fly pencils rather than any pens. Um, we still fly very, very old fashioned computer system because they just don't wanna take any chances. And yet there are so many satellites being launched today because we so heavily rely on their functions to maintain our lifestyle. So some of these jumps that we see in terms of the objects in space, some of them are actually man-made effects as well. There was a few um, demonstration of space-based weapons. There was a collision in space. Um, the video that, uh, that that I have laid on actually is a depiction of like artist rendering of what would have happened in space. So instead of having one big satellite, now we have thousands and hundreds of thousands of little chips that's floating in space. And to make the matters even worse, now we mass produce satellites. I mean, here's just an image that I got from the Google, but the reality is that we are literally printing satellites. So when I teach materials for spacecraft, we used to talk about the harsh environment. We talked about um, the, the extreme temperature. We talked about radiation. Today, there's literally a chapter in a textbook called manufacturability. How fast can we assemble a satellite in a most cost-effective way? which is new. I mean, as I said, I, I graduated in the 90s. I was a space engineer for seven years in the industry. And we couldn't even imagine building a satellite with more than, like with the same design of satellite more than once. We, we built most back in and was launched in 2000. When NeoSat came about, it, those are both microsatellites that Canada operated and owned. It was similar, but it was different. And we were, there, there were years in between. So manufacturability, as much as we wanted to have accessible certain components and whatnot, but it wasn't a high priority. But today, people are fabricating satellites like one every few hours, not, not one every few years. So you can imagine how those things will have an impact in our space environment. And even a tiny little speck, as I mentioned, can cause huge damage to bring systems down. And we are seeing more and more of news like this, and even the space shuttle itself had to maneuver several times to protect itself from uh, oncoming traffic. People are keeping an eye on what's happening. Um, there are some countries who are constantly monitoring what's falling out of sky, basically, because some of these objects coming back to Earth are getting bigger and more dangerous and becoming more unpredictable. So again, if I can do one thing today, it's to let everyone know that space is becoming a very congested area where we need to keep an eye on it. We just have to protect ourselves, as I said. So to do that, um, this, this is an image that people use from ESA um, that this this must have happened for some of our satellites that that was that went under um, weapon testing, collision in space, and now it's it's these images are used to promote some of these awareness issues. Um, 
And also these are the similar images we also use to, to talk about how it impacts the astronomers effort to observe stars. There are lots of streaks that we see which are caused by satellites passing through. And this particular image is the image of a star link in a low Earth orbit when they were first launched and they were just dominating all the star fields to a point that astronomers couldn't make any significant observations. And there are more and more images of this nature. Now, on, on the military side, because we recognize that we have to protect our asset, um, there are countries who are now introducing something called the Space Force. U.S. has a designated Space Force. Canada doesn't. Um, we have a group within the Air Force that actually does look after space issues. Um, but it is becoming a challenge that not only that we have to keep an eye on what's happening in space, but also find ways to protect our asset as in our own satellites. Canada operates not quite 100 satellites, but we do have quite a few operating satellites and keeping an eye on them, making sure that they are still in good condition, good health, good, um, good, good hands uh, is becoming a bigger issue. And not, not that my research is directly related to military applications, but I think we really need to recognize that um, the same way we recognize the, the pollution in the ocean or climate change, these are all intertwined and we really have to look at it from a very high level. So three C's of the space that we talk about today almost in every context in the research as well as the operation is congested, contested, and competitive. Um, none of this was the case when I started my career off back in the 90s. Um, Again, there were only a handful of countries with a very strong industry in the space sector. Most of the space operation was reserved for state-owned units like NASA and CSA. But today, as small as university groups launch satellites and operate them, and there's very, we are somewhat behind in terms of policy and how we maintain the security in space. So it, it is becoming a huge challenge in every aspect of our daily lives. So again, three Cs, congested, contested, and competitive are the main theme of where we are heading. So that was really long introduction. So I, with that, I'm gonna jump on to the actual two topics that I wanted to talk about today in terms of what I do with my students every day. I studied this presentation with uh, the title Lee plus 24, and that's because I have 24 team members who contributed to these slides and I want to recognize them. And what else I do in terms of raising this awareness about the concerns that's now becoming a true issue in today's society. So I just called it more than engineering, but I just wanted to once again show you a few images. Um, I don't think we are actually set up to pause and answer questions. And I, I see that there are some questions coming up in the chat, but I really am not good at multitasking, so I probably won't be able to answer as I go on, but if needed, somebody probably should give me a hands up and, and tell me to pause and answer a question before I do. Is that okay, Afshin? Like, I'll just keep going until somebody says pause and answer the particular question. Yes, please go ahead. At the end, okay. we have Q&A, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. So. What I personally do and I'm interested in doing as a researcher at York is to build a payload, as I mentioned, that has always been my research interest, but that can also keep an eye on these satellites. My original, basically my thesis and my research interest in all your days of my career was to build the star trackers for what we call attitude determination. So we use star field to determine which direction a satellite is pointing at and finding ways to precisely point an instrument in a particular part of the earth or space to make scientific observations. But more and more, as I mentioned, there are lots of these objects in our field and we are starting to recognize them. And we are starting to see that as an opportunity to use this instrument for both attitude determination and what we call RSO tracking or resident space object or any debris or any active satellite in space tracking. So a lot of my work in the last three, four years have been focused on how to image these objects, how to identify them, how to characterize them, and how to correlate them to the, the objects that, that's already recorded in the catalog. So a lot of my discussion is about building this payload. Um, it's basically in a form factor of a CubeSat. So we've been looking at it as a whole satellite, but it's not, it's just a payload. And what we've done to collect images of similar nature 
and how we analyze those images. It's still very early in, in the stage. So again, because my research strength has always been on the satellite design, um, a lot of algorithms had to come from that spacecraft manufacturing side and had to transition to more object uh, detection and image processing that I'm still you know, catching up base. And, and I'm always interested in working with my colleagues who are more experts on those image processing side. So the first payload we flew was designed a few years ago. It's in a form factor. And again, this is about 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 20 centimeters. So it's again, size of a tissue box um, with a fairly large field of view camera. Um, these are typical cameras that's used in just laboratories, not necessarily designed for space application, but we tested it with a space-like environment and demonstrated that it's good enough. We flew a secondary camera in, in the basically blank space. We wanted to look upward rather than just in the horizon. So we lifted it up, created a little space and flew a small uh, payload more as part of our arts project. And I'll talk about that later on. So this was launched on a Stratus balloon. Uh, we didn't want to actually put it in the orbit. Um, that sort of defeats the purpose of trying to keep clean space. So rather than putting it in the orbit, we flew it on a Stratus balloon, which went up to about 40 kilometers. We collected the images during um, the whole operation. It came back and we ended up with tens of thousands of images. So here's our payload on a gondola. Um, just to give you an idea, this whole platform that you're looking at is about the size of a minivan. Um, these operations uh, happen about once a year in Timmins, Ontario, about six hours north of here, uh, run by CNES, which is the French Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency, it's a joint operation. Um, usually there's about four or five campaigns, so, so four or five times they launch these balloons. Some are during the day, some are during the night. We are obviously in the night flight because we wanted to see the night skies. We are actually interested in dawn and dusk period, but we do keep our camera on throughout the night. Um, there's about six, seven university groups or companies that come together for each of these mm -hmm. and work together. So beyond collecting scientific images, this was also a really great training tool where I was able to bring as many as eight students to the field. And for a spacecraft launch, we can only have one or two people supporting it. It's a very expensive campaign. It's a really lengthy process. Whereas the Stratus balloon has been relatively low cost. We are able to do this whole mission for under a quarter million dollars, including all the student salary and three years worth of payload development and were able to train dozens of students. So it's been a very rewarding process. So here's the video of our balloon launch. Regina. Oh, okay. I didn't mean to the sound, but anyway, so I'm one of our students. I'm concerned, I'll just move on. We launched around 11 o'clock at night. Uh, it took a few hours and floated for nine hours and then came back next day. Um, so we had in total of about four or five hours of observation period. Initially, it was very unstable and we couldn't really take a lot of stable images. But even those images, now we are starting to analyze them because there are scenarios where satellites are not so stable and they are still making observations and we wanted to use them. So we are looking at those. Um, while it's coming down, obviously we won't be able to do it. And luckily we are able to retrieve the payload as well. So in total, um, from the nine hour flight, we are able to collect nearly 100,000 images. Many of us, my students, myself, our postdoc, everybody sat in the dark room with the hood over our heads or over the monitor, trying to go through each and every one of those images to see if there are any RSOs or satellites going by. And we were super excited to see some of them. Now you might wonder like, what's so hard about flying a camera on a balloon? I mean, you put it together for a power supply and then hook it up and launch it. Well, Temperature is definitely one aspect of it. Um, it can go down as low as negative 80 degrees. Um, there's no radiation, but it's it's a vacuum environment. So anything plastic will explode. Um, we, we had to make sure that every component we put there had to be space qualifiable. 
Um, we didn't really worry about radiation because we were only up there for one day. It's not like we had to survive radiative environment for months and years. But there were lots of other things. And just to give ourselves more challenge, we wanted to put it in a CubeSat platform. So it really had to fit inside that 10 by 10 by 20 and mass of less than two kilograms. And so that was a huge challenge uh, as well. The long-term plan of that was to make sure that we are ready to fly on a satellite if needed. So I'll tell you a little bit more about it. There were a few things that we couldn't do in 2022, including getting a live stream video. So we had very limited data bandwidth and we were only able to broadcast the health of the payload. Um, even though we did have a, a really good data set by the end of it, we couldn't tell. The whole night we were just biting our nails thinking, is it working? Is it collecting images? And it was only the next day that we were able to see images like this and we were yelling and screaming and be very excited about it. So this is an image we showed at the Science Center. We would tell a group of young students to count how many objects are moving. The reason I have a red bar versus yellow circle is to show you that anything that's not moving is a star. You can imagine taking an image of the night sky and stars and in a short period of time, you just appear as a static dot, whereas satellites going around will show up as a moving dots. Usually we get guesses like one and two. Anybody with a really, really good eyesight will pick out a few at the bottom. Um, again, it's a little difficult to engage with the audience in today's setting, but if you guessed 25, you would be right. <laughs> um, once we filter the image, we actually see a lot more. It did take lots and lots of effort and time to filter almost 100,000 images, but we did end up seeing uh, about 300 unique RSOs. And some of them were starlings because the, those are the obvious ones, but we also were able to observe rocket bodies, like the pieces that fell out of rocket bodies, defunct satellites, as well as other um, very active satellites. Now, purposely I picked this particular image on screen because this image was processed by a high school student. He ended up writing a paper on it there aren't that many researchers who are sharing images of this nature. And even though the, the processing method is really simple, again, I'm not a, a vision scientist, so I knew very little about it, but it, there are so many tools available out there that within months, a high school student was able to pick out 25 objects in an image of this nature. So you can imagine what our students can do once we do this, and obviously just choosing an object or recognizing an object is a very small portion of the research, because once we've done that, then we have to characterize it, we have to correlate it, but still, this was a really incredibly rewarding process as a new researcher in this field. Um, as I mentioned, we are using various techniques. Mm -hmm. We started with something really, really simple, like frame differencing that even high school students can implement, and we've moved on. Uh, we also look at streak detection. I didn't even know the difference and it's been only a few years and, and I'm so excited about it. So some images do show up as streaks when, when it's long exposure. So instead of just having dots moving, so it's not just tracking on object. Now we actually do streak detection, which also tells us which direction the object was moving. Then we can exploit um, the, the orbital parameters of the target object, et cetera. Uh, more recently, we've been looking at more advanced methods like YOLO and faster RCNN. Uh, we are getting fairly decent results. I don't know if the video will play. There you go. And I don't think this will play, but um, it's been a challenge. When we publish papers, it's surprising that people think the methods that we are using is already old, even though to me, it sounds like very modern, very new techniques but they do want us to publish because they want the data set, which goes to show that there has been a bit of a silo between space industry or space researchers and you know, the vision scientists. Um, while there are lots and lots of techniques to process these images, there haven't been enough data sets that we can challenge ourselves with. So I'm again, hoping that we can be one of those groups who provide data sets with a very fundamental result as, as a benchmark. So let's see if I can, oh, 2023, we wanted to do it again. I know, I mean, it was 
such a grueling schedule in 22, the lots and lots of sleepless nights and very hungry days and long hours, but the students wanted to do it again. So we did it again. Um, but this time we doubled the number of cameras. We doubled the number of data sets that we were able to collect. We doubled um, the capability to download the information in live stream. So whole night we were able to actually tell how well our payload was doing. Um, and you can already see the difference between the previous image and this image we were able to right away detect the, the objects that we are observing. And unfortunately, it's been only four months and we are still in the process of going through some of these images. And I'm hoping that by the end of this year, in 2024, we can share the labeled data set with the community. But these are some of the preliminary results that we've seen. And again, compared to the previous one, it's already cleaner, uh, more active, much larger number of objects. We were able to do actually on um, live change or real time change between operation modes. So we were able to do object detection versus strict detection. And if you think about it, 10 years ago, when we looked up in the starry sky, we never imagined the dots moving like this. Um, occasionally you might see an airplane, airplane flying by, but today, if you just look up, you'll see satellites fly by. There are so many Starlink satellites that Occasionally, my students and I just go out to the parking lot at night and we look up and we see Starlink satellites fly by. So things are different. Um, we live in a very different world. And I have a lot of work to do to collect these images and process them before I can share with everyone else. And of course, we can't just rely on the satellite images. Um, we collect images from ground too. Um, one of my very talented students wanted to take a picture of himself taking pictures. So this is an image from Ottawa. We tried to set up four or five different telescopes in different locations, one in Blue Mountain, one in Ottawa, one in Toronto, try to observe the same objects from various locations. We haven't been able to um, collect any significant amount of data during this because it gets cold. And every time we set up outside, the weather is not so great. Um, but it's been an ongoing effort and we'll continue to collect more images that way too. And this is another image our students took when they went camping, I think, back in 2022. Um, again, just using your everyday cell phone, he just looked up, started recording, and we could see satellites fly by. So we even process these images because it's interesting. It's just different. It's not what we do. A lot of our research is also about generating images, like simulating images, as in what they would look like if we were to see from a, a, a satellite in, in a low Earth orbit or whatnot. So not only that we can pro now provide the, the, the images that we've taken in the field or on the spacecraft, we can actually provide the simulated images that's cleaner and that's labeled and that has a lot of details that people do need to do the, the vision science research. Now we are on the team to build the next spacecraft that will do this on an operation um, aspect. So we work with a company called Magellan. Um, they are working with DRDC and a couple of other industry partners to build the next microsatellite. To give you a brief history, um, Canada has operated two other SSA spacecraft. Uh, NeoSat is one, Sapphire was another one. Both of those satellites performed relatively well. They, they were able to observe a number of objects in space and catalog them, but they're both aging. They're not performing as well as they did when they were younger, they're like 10 years old. So we are on the team to build the next spacecraft and it's scheduled to be launched in 2627. Um, as part of the mission team, we'll be receiving the data from that satellite, and there will be a lot more work to process them and making sure that we are keeping an eye on our own satellite. So a lot of the work we do is to track uh, Canadian assets like RadarSat or other Canadian spacecraft. So there will be more work. I'm looking forward to it. Um, this is an image. Uh, of the work of one of my students who used another spacecraft um, called Cassiope. The spacecraft itself was launched over 10 years ago and it's almost dying. It wasn't intended to be used for RSO tracking or anything. It's actually to observe Aurora, um, the Northern sky and whatnot. 
but as I explained earlier, any image or any camera that's in space now see objects. So if we can get an access to any of those images, we download them and we look for them. This is a really interesting image because unlike the image I've shown earlier on, now everything is moving. Stars are moving, the satellites are moving, debris are moving, and that's because Cassiope satellite is on its last leg and it's lost the control function. So it's constantly rotating. It can no longer hold its orientation in one fixed frame. It actually slowly rotates and you see that in an image, um, which means that even if the satellite has completed all its functions and can no longer serve its scientific purpose, we can still use those images for what we are trying to do here to detect other objects. And that's what this student was trying to achieve. So you can you can see some of the objects flying by and he's detecting them from um, the, the moving objects. We had to play with it for a while. Um, we now have fairly large data set from the FAI images, which is now publicly available. And we are once again, hoping to share that with the community because what we the technique we've used called ICP is again a fairly old technique and it 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 has limitations and we are wondering if there are more modern techniques that people can apply these images to and come up with a much better answer. So these are some of the techniques that we've used and, and I'm just gonna skip ahead because again I left them as more of my backup slides in case anybody's interested in more vision side or what we've done with those images. I have about two minutes according to the schedule. So I'll probably use three minutes instead <laughs> since we started two minutes late and show you a few more pretty pictures if that's okay. Yes, for sure. So very quickly, um, my mission is not necessarily to show the world that I can process the, these images better than anybody else. Obviously there are lots of experts who can do it. My mission is to collect as many images as I can from various platforms and share them with the community for them to develop algorithms. But more importantly, through this exercise, I've made it my mission to share that whole passion with the world as in why this is important to keep an eye on this congested space. So we've been looking for ways to share that information with the world. And I found a colleague in, in AMPD, basically an artist, who wanted to explore an option of doing this through the eyes of art. So we are doing various uh, projects, uh, trying to bring some of this scientific data and sort of translate it in, in, into the format that we can share with the community. Um, he has lots and lots of really fancy words like data democratization, making it accessible. I don't quite understand the process of it because I'm not an artist and I'm no subject matter expert, but I would be happy to provide data for him to turn this into something amazing. And it's been a great journey in the last two, three years to go with him to some of these events and finding ways to engage public about it. And that's where a lot of these pretty images do came from. So I have very talented students who go out there and purposely take images that's pretty, but not necessarily have scientific significance like the one that I've shown here. So we do purposely take pictures of the setup that we use to take these images. And we use that image as part of the conversation too, because it's all, sometimes a little easier to talk to young students or general public about why this is important when we have a visual aid that we can relate to. We even write poetry, like I, again, we, we are a bunch of engineers and we can't do it. So this is one of the images from the Science Center last year. We've done about 10 of these shows. We ended up talking to over 2000 young students and their families. Um, a lot of my engineering students are not necessarily comfortable in talking to these young kids, but we do go through training of our own. We prepare our discussions and our presentation. And this particular event, it was run like a theater production. So again, it's a very different type of training for engineering and science students, as well as the art students who work with us. So I get to work with uh, digital media students, theater majors, um, video videographers, um, audio scientists, and all of which have been a very rewarding experience. Um, uh, from those 10 day, uh, 20 show, sort of like a production type of event, we collected about 3000 messages from young students 
that they wanted to send to space. So we collected them, individually scanned them, put them in a big um, in a big file and etched it onto the plate, which ended up flying with our payload last year. So next month in February, we are going back to the Science Center for about a week with some of these components and the messages that students wrote. Um, and we'll be meeting the general audience about the whole meaning of this, why this was important, what the students thought of uh, when they were given an opportunity to write messages and whatnot. So some of those messages got onto the back of the PCB board. Some of them went into the plate. Um, these are two of my favorite messages. Uh, one that says, please name a satellite after me. And we wanted to tell her that you know, the satellites have awful names and she probably didn't want to do that. Please show me a video of a satellite to me. So that's one of the things that we'd like to do. So hopefully this young student named Vivian will have a chance to come back and see the video of the satellite launched. So those are the things that we've been doing. Another event that just wrapped up about a month ago was the art exhibit. Um, I tried to make a video, but it didn't really work out. It was a full uh, gallery exhibition in London, Ontario. Actually, maybe the next page would be better. Um, where the feature uh, display was the wall we created. Again, working with the audio sign, audio artist and the visual artist, we, we try to create a, a, a scene where it depicts the current state of space environment. So each one of these PCBs are engineering models of CubeSat or satellite that universities have worked on. So I worked with a team from University of Manitoba, uh, York University CubeSat team, as well as a, a university in South Korea. They donated some of these components and we are able to put it together and it actually lights up, it's beautiful when, when they are all lit up. Um, but we also worked with the artist to, to create sort of a background that brings in, there's a lot of meaning behind it, which I probably won't be able to explain since I'm not the artist, but a lot of this came together at the end and we had about three months exhibition. So this is an ongoing effort. I am hoping that this work will continue on and we'll have more opportunities to share our passion with the public as well. So I'll stop there. And I'll take questions. And I'm sorry, I actually went over time by four minutes. Not okay. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Lee. A very, very nice presentation, very informative. Thank you so much. So uh, this is the time for Q&A. Basically, uh, if anybody has a question, sorry, uh, for unstable video that I don't know why it's today. But uh, anyway, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, in the chat or write your question in Q&A box. Uh, I see two questions here. Uh, I can read from this Q&A box. Let's start with the first one. If there are so many satellites now, why are there so few available data sets like the ones you, you have been producing? One, it's a fairly new field. There are some data sets available, but most of them are simulated images because there aren't too many satellites taking images of other satellites. And, and majority of the images are taken from ground. So for example, um, US operates something called the Space Fence and they do keep an eye on all operating spacecrafts in the world, but they don't necessarily share that data set. What we are trying to offer is the idea of um, uh, anyone taking pictures of every satellite and being able to label it and contribute to creating full catalog. So while the data sets that, that I'm referring to are limited, there are other data sets that are being used for commercial use or military use. And especially on the simulated side where they are um, creating simulated field for the purpose of algorithm design. Um, where we think we are also making a headway is also the fact that we are labeling them. So we are painfully going through each and every one of those images and circling the, um, the, the objects in the field of view. Not, not that we know for sure that that's 100% reliable. I mean, sometimes our students might fall asleep and may, may not be able to find each and every dot, but I think that's where our data sets are unique. And also some of this information can be sensitive since we are taking images of the objects in public domain. So there's always that concern as well. Okay, great. Uh, the next question from uh, 
the chat box. Hello, Professor. Are there any machines or technologies being developed to clean up the space debris? Indeed. So for the first time in the history of space operation, there was an on or be servicing. So there are a number of efforts trying to minimize this operating satellites in space. And one is to extend the life of uh, operational satellites. And in order to do that, you need more fuel, you need a new component. It's not like a car that you can go and service and extend its life by 10 years. So a few years ago, for the first time, one satellite attached itself to another satellite, refueled and went separate ways. There were a lot of people who sort of weren't sure if that was gonna work because these things are moving at seven kilometers per second. And to have them come together, not in geosynchronous orbit, but still. Um, but it happened. It was actually really exciting. We were able to observe it. When I say observe it, it looks like two dots coming together, two dots going apart. But still, um, that was exciting. There's also a huge research community who's looking for ways to remove debris from space. There are some people who have crazy ideas like create a net, create a magnet, create a sweeper. Um, there are lots of science fiction movies that's out there about cleaning up space, the space junk. Um, but it's not just the science fiction. There are lots of research efforts looking at it. But before we can remove satellites, because there's also a concern about whose responsibility is it? How do we ensure that nobody's going to try to remove someone else's satellite? We need to know exactly what's out there. Again, if we are thinking about like objects as small as a millimeter in its size, we don't have a full catalog. We really have no ways of keeping an eye on all of this. So before we can actually go out there and clean it up, my personal view is that we need to first catalog each and every one of them and have a policy to voluntarily remove itself once it's done with its useful life like life in orbit. Does that mean it has to come back to Earth? Most likely. There is a parking orbit where that satellite can go and die, but that whole space is getting crowded too. Then there's the second question of, does it impact our environment when it re-enters our atmosphere? Because there are lots of metal that satellites are built with that can actually burn up when it's heated, it can release gas and it can damage our ozone layer and whatnot. So lots and lots of research still has to be done. As I mentioned, space exploration is still relatively new field. It's not like building cars or building houses. It's still new. We've gone super fast in the last only few years. And there are lots of challenges and questions that we have to answer before it's completely out of control. Because we are in a stage where everybody's building lots of satellites super fast, not thinking about the consequences. Don't tell Elon Musk I said that, but I think we need to be a little bit more responsible about this whole process. OK, great. So as a follow up on your basically explanation, you mentioned that when the satellite falls in the atmosphere, there are some drawbacks for that, right? This is not what we want, correct? Yes. What, what are the, the problems? So again, um, some metals will disintegrate and it, it will outgas. Um, so basically create gas that's going to damage our environment. Um, there's also um, potential of objects landing in an area where they can damage other uh, life forms. We've had satellite pieces landing in the middle of desert, but also very close to where we live, which can be a huge concern. Sometimes the objects end up in a forest where nobody will notice for a long time. So again, it's an unused metal that that will just decay and cause more trouble. Um, it is important to keep an eye on where everything is going, and there's no one agency who's doing it. Um, because at the end of the day, it happens very rarely and we don't want to cause panic because uh, mm -hmm. it can be a disaster. At the same time, we need to find ways to manage it. True. Thank you so much. So the next question is, uh, uh, are the satellite names assigned by the government? No, it's not. We all name our own satellites and they're usually acronyms, really weird, stupid. Oh, no, okay, I shouldn't say stupid. I am still being recorded, but they are acronyms. Um, just to give you an idea, the last CubeSat mission we worked on was led by University of Manitoba. So for the longest time, we called it Manitoba Set. Easy, University of Manitoba, Manitoba Set. And within the last months of it being launched, 
we had a little competition for young students. Um, so all the elementary students got to choose name of the satellite. So only at the last minute, we changed its name to Iris, which is really pretty. It actually meant something. But a lot of satellites get its own names from some long form of an acronym. And sometimes it's impossible to pronounce it. But um, what would be the other really good example? I can't think of anything, but they tend to be more acronyms. They're not assigned by anybody. OK, perfect. Uh, the next question is that uh, what the difference between what is the difference between the fuel used in satellites and rockets and which which one is more prone to blow up if there was an accident well definitely rockets you need lots and lots of liquid fuels to get get it up there satellites themselves don't necessarily have fuels they have thrusters there are different types of thrusters so one type of thrusters that thruster that i worked on was a solid propellant one it's like a gunpowder so it's a very small amount of gunpowder that um, fires in a certain direction to maneuver spacecraft. While they do move at seven kilometers per second, they don't necessarily maneuver fast or by much. We only adjust orbit very little at a time and attitude even less. There are new ideas like using tethers for electromagnetic field to, to maneuver spacecraft. There are um, solar sails as one of the ways to, to maneuver spacecraft. So there are lots of thruster concepts, but not necessarily a liquid fuel. We don't necessarily fly fuel or anything liquid on a spacecraft. Okay, great. And the next question is, have you tried to detect changes in your images using AI or using non-RGB images for change detection? So we have, I briefly showed a YOLO uh, experiment that we've done. We had a student who looked at YOLO as a way of detecting objects. That was painful. Um, at the end, we concluded that it's an overkill. We have basically black background with white dots. We don't need YOLO to detect some small features. We've been looking at our, our CNN um, on various ways. And the latest one is the faster RCNN. It's performing okay, but it's still, too big, as in we won't be able to do that on orbit in real time. So we are looking for other methods of doing it. Um, ultimately, it really has to be run in real time if we're gonna do this as part of the satellite operation. So again, I am hoping that I have more colleagues who are interested in these data sets and they can come up with the better ideas. Okay, perfect. And the question, next question, is there a risk analysis? for the possibility of a space debris returning to Earth? It's new thing. I think only a few months ago, somebody or some institution had to put forward a plan to deorbit at the end. So it's relatively new. It has been in a, an agreement at, at the UN level to make sure that no satellites launched without the risk analysis. And that there are different types of risk analysis. So risk analysis as in, having a plan to either return to Earth or park itself or not to become basically a debris. Um, as a satellite engineer, we do go through lots and lots of risk analysis. In fact, half of our work is about risk analysis, but not necessarily about space debris. Um, what would happen if the weather's not good, the payload is disabled? So more on the project side, we do a lot of risk analysis but not about the space debris returning to Earth. There is a new group and University of Waterloo, I think is one of the very, very few groups who's looking at it. I, I, I dare to say for the first time, but I could be wrong. I, I'm not too versed, well versed in that. Okay, perfect. And the next question, we have so many questions. The uh, topic is very interesting. So <laughs> okay. it raises a lot of questions. In the event of a larger satellite returns to Earth, once it hits the ground, uh, for instance, in BC, what authority would take charge? Again, this is new. So up until now, we always just assume that it will burn up in atmosphere. You've seen the movies where like it enters the atmosphere, it gets really, really hot, it burns up. So on a tiny little cube that it'll just burn up, we won't see anything. By the time it comes to Earth, it'll be a tiny little thing. It's not gonna do much damage. But we are starting to see more and more events where larger pieces are landing on Earth. So the latest one is the one that landed in Saudi Arabia in the middle of a desert. And it was a fairly large fuel tank from a rocket 
that just fell. We think um, actually only last December, there was a talk about Chinese rocket that sort of disintegrated and fell back to earth and everyone was tracking it very closely. Then obviously the next question is who's gonna pay for the damage if it falls on somebody's backyard? There is no one policy that governs it and that's one of the, the issues. So there are lots of people, uh, for example, McGill has a space law institute that's looking at some of these things. Again, up until now, it's been more of an agreement on, on the UN, um, no different than the, the international water in the ocean that's been looking at some of these issues, but it's still fairly new. We haven't really gone to that point where this has to be written in a law and have an insurance for any operator that's gonna operate in space. So I'm not aware of any one particular authority that does this. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, for the interest of time, uh, as a last question, can we use hydrogen fuel in rockets? No clue, I don't know. I'm, okay. I, I'm being honest, I really don't know. Uh, maybe, Perfect. <laughs> but I, I don't think that has been, I actually honestly don't know. Um, but it's an interesting question. Maybe we should look into that. Okay, thank I'll you so much. Right <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. very informative, interesting topic and nice presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Lee, for your presentation. Uh, before ending the session, I would like to hand it over to Professor Wu for the final remarks. Thanks, everyone, for attending this webinar and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, well, thank you uh, Dr. Professor Zara and uh, uh, I just want to thank you uh, on behalf of Ymerge and CIFA and the uh, subcluster founded by uh, York uh, VPI office for 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 supporting this uh, seminar series that uh, has the purpose uh, of bringing together and uh, uh, the exceptional expertise from six faculties involved. And uh, today is a spectacular show from our engineering school. And I uh, want to thank the speaker. And the moderator, and I also thank our staff from both CIFA and Ymerge. I will let Leila, uh, she did uh, such a wonderful job on her first month of on duty as a, a Ymerge coordinator to tell you what we're going to do next. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you, and hello again, everyone. It's great to have you all here. Thank you all for joining us today. I sincerely thank Dr. Lee for the outstanding presentation and Dr. Zara for moderating this session. Our next session is scheduled for February 15th at the same time as today from 12 to 1 p.m. We'll update you on the topic of the upcoming session and the speaker through the Y Emerge and CIFA LinkedIn pages. Please consider following us on these platforms to stay updated if you haven't already. Your participation in this lecture series means a lot to us, and we are eagerly looking forward to seeing you at the next one. So have a wonderful day, and goodbye, everyone. Have a good day. Bye, everyone.